to save your soul from death It's all works righteousness, you know Can I manufacture grace for self-denial in some religious place By weeping hard on your face Or saying prayers to some dead saints, you know Through the sun, loving him more than other loves, family, friends, yourself, and a one. By grace alone, through faith alone, on the word alone, because of Christ alone, he is our own. It is really good to welcome you again and today I am very happy to be able to introduce to you uh, Terry Patrick Stillen, really Terence because he was called after a famous man whom we'll get into a little bit of the history afterwards but you're welcome to the program Terry. Thank you Richard. And um, today we're going to speak about the contrast of somebody who had come from a Croat Irish background and I can identify with some of that being Irish myself and there's some military overtones to uh, what um, Terry's background is like my own case growing up in a military compound we call it McKee Barracks in Dublin Ireland so I come from a, a military background myself and uh, very conscious as I grew up of the IRA blood that was in my veins through my father and that tradition that I grew up in. So uh, in just talking with you a little bit this morning before we have begun this interview, I realize, Terry, that you had something yourself of this background. Just tell me a little bit about your name because I'm fascinated that you were called after Terence McSweeney. Tell me a little bit about him and how you happen to be called T Terry. Sure. Well, my my mother's parents um, were from Ireland. Uh, my father's parents were from mm -hmm. Yugoslavia. And uh, my last name is Stillen, which is obviously Yugoslavian. Um, my uh, mother um, had permission from my father to name all of my, myself and my brothers Irish, Irish first and middle names. So all of us have, have Irish names. I've got a brother, Danny. I've got a brother, Dennis. I had a brother Bobby and, and then my name was Terry. And in, in my case, my grandfather um, named me after um, Terence McSweeney, who um, from what I understand um, died of a hunger strike during the 1916 Easter Rebellion, 1918, I'm not quite sure what the dates were. But um, he was so impressed with, with Terence McSweeney and his dedication to the, his cause that um, he was able to to convince my parents to name me after after Mr. McSweeney. Yeah, that whole time in history, uh, my own family was involved in my father, and later on in the Civil War, and it was so traumatic and uh, so devastating in our family that it was hard to talk about it. You know, my father would talk now and again, and. Uh, he would stop and he was like emotionally distraught because of the horrors that he'd been through and of what had happened and uh, particularly in the Irish Civil War. So I know the background and uh, of course Terence McSweeney is a famous Irish name and uh, you came then from that tradition in a certain sense because your mother was Irish, is that correct? Correct. Yeah. yeah. Yes. And your father was actually Croat from Croatia, is that correct? Well, his parents were from Croatia, and yeah. they were first generation. And like a lot of, um, a lot of the Croatian people, they, they settled in different parts of the country. Uh, in this case, they settled in the upper peninsula of Michigan, primarily to work in the mines. The copper mines at that time were, which, you know, in the, in the teens and 20s, was a very, uh, uh, very popular place to work. 
So that's where they settled and then eventually migrated to the Detroit area to work in the automotive industry. Yes. Uh, well, the Irish and the Croats are very, very similar, both being very traditionally Catholic and uh, Catholic to the extent of being willing to fight for Catholicism. And we had the famous Ustashi uh, and the horrors of what happened in Croatia uh, during and a little bit after the Second World War. And uh, these, in a certain sense, really um, outshine in horror the, um, what had happened in Ireland. And it is um, the whole history of Croatia and Ireland are quite similar that uh, a lot of the history is written in blood and it is, it is quite painful. But when you come from that tradition, then you must have been steeped in Roman Catholicism. So how was it as you grew up? How was your education? What was your family like? And um, well, we were very background. Excuse yeah. me. We were very devoutly Catholic. Um, you know, we, we attended, uh, my brothers and I attended uh, Catholic schools, parochial schools. Uh, my older brother um, actually uh, uh, went to seminary. Um, Catholic seminary. Uh, I myself, um, and as, as a youngster, I was probably a little um, um, uh, out of control. And mm. my, 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 my parents felt that they, I needed a little bit more discipline. So um, they located a school um, that uh, was run by a certain order of nuns, the Sisters of St. Joseph, uh, but it also happened to be a military academy. So it, I, I attended a military academy uh, in my adolescent years, and I continued to, to attend there until, until uh, um, about uh, 12 or 13. At that yeah. time, I, I ended up going to, to regular public school. Do I understand you correctly, Terry? You're saying that you went to a military academy run by nuns? Correct. Yes. So, uh, what sort of military training did you have then that it could be run by nuns? It doesn't seem to, it just doesn't seem to fit the picture, you know. Uh, well, it, you know, it was, it was the, the school uh, at the time, it's no longer in existence, but at the time the school had, 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 had been um, in operation for well over 75 years. And it was, um, um, there happened to be a, a, a military um, army based located nearby where they were able to access a number of the uh, the military personnel to, to, to do inspections and to do those types of things that you would find in a, in a military environment. But it was very common for the sisters mm -hmm. to um, uh, help you and, and teach you how to march uh, <laughs> on, a, uh, on a regular basis. Uh -huh. Were they in their habits when they were teaching you to march? Yes, they were, yeah. Um, they were also in their habits when they taught us how to play baseball and, yeah, and yeah. to do a lot of other yeah, functions yeah, too. Yeah, yeah, it is, um, yes, it is. It, it seems strange, but um, that is Catholicism. It seems to embody every aspect of life, but this is the first time of hearing of, a, of nuns running a military academy. Now, they're at this school, did you learn and uh, be prepared for First Communion, or was that afterwards? Well, when I, when I um, first went to military school, it was actually I was in third grade, uh, and actually the school began it for first graders, but I didn't attend there until the third grade. I had already made my First Communion. Uh, I had made my First Communion uh, about a year or two prior to that. Um, but I did, uh, while, I, while I was attending military school, actually uh, prepared for and made my, my confirmation, holy confirmation. Yes, yes. Was there anything startling about that? You know, did you really think that you were now a full Christian, a mature Christian, and willing to, uh, you know, to uh, defend your Catholic faith? Or well, I, I can't say that I, that I called myself a Christian. I called myself a Catholic. Um, I, I do remember looking back, um, just studying very diligently, um, both myself and, 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 and other students, um, making sure that, that we knew all of the questions. Uh, should one of the, uh, the bishops or the bishop uh, ask us, uh, and we were told that, that we would be asked certain questions, that it was important that we, that we know the answers. So I remember studying very diligently um, 
um, everything that was uh, presented to us at that time. Yeah, it's good that you really corrected me there and said that you had learned to be Catholic. It was the same actually in my background. Uh, we would say emphatically that we were Catholic and not Protestant. We didn't use the word Christian, but we insisted you know, that we were Catholic as distinct from those who were Christian. Uh, whom we uh, call Protestants, and I don't like to use that word at all in actual fact. I never use it because in Ireland it had, it had, um, it had uh, political overtones, and uh, I see myself as a Christian now and not Protestant whatsoever in the Irish sense of the term, and uh, really try to speak with an empathy uh, towards those who are, you know, Catholic, and our listener, uh, most probably is Catholic, and we try to speak with a, an empathy because we come from that background and we're trying to show the truth of the gospel, that it's not in any church that is in Christ Jesus. Now, as you continued on uh, in your teenage years, uh, did you celebrate like Easter and Christmas or Midnight Mass and things like that? And if so, how did you prepare for these things and what state of mind were you when you, when you celebrated these big Catholic feasts? Well, as I, as I got into my teenage years, and, and I, I don't think I was not unlike any other um, young person at that time, um, I began to uh, attend church less frequently. Um, but I continued to, to, to hang on to my Catholic faith. I found myself that I, I was always uh, available to attend Midnight Mass, um, attend Christmas, uh, well, the Christmas, you know, Midnight Mass, also the Easter services. Uh, but that's about the only time that I did attend church um, as I got into my, into my, my high school uh, age group. I can remember one, one instance when um, uh, we had family members over for Christmas Eve and uh, we, uh, which was very common in my family, um, we uh, were celebrating the uh, the birth of Christ. Um, though I can I can I can say that probably was not first and foremost on our mind at that time, uh, but there was a lot of drinking that took place, um, and I can remember um, uh, drinking quite heavily, and and feeling the need to go to to midnight mass that evening. Yeah, and uh, I did go, but I was. Um, I was quite intoxicated and could not remember one thing that the priest had had to say. Yes, yes, yes. Time. It is sad that uh, that has been the case with um, quite a number of Catholics whereby, um, you know, drinking really did uh, inhibit anything that could have been said, you know, at, at some of these services. And it, it, it is really sad because the, um, that had been... Uh, a uh, factor in Irish life so much, you know, in my own background, uh, you know, to celebrate something, um, they would talk about being oiled up, you know, getting <laughs> oiled up, and that you really couldn't go through one of these big occasions without being oiled up. And that's, that is really sad because it's, uh, it is really the fact that then liquor becomes predominant and, uh, that um, a person's consciousness is not uh, what it should be and uh, certainly not appropriate for, for what, what you explain, you know, celebrating a, um, seemingly the birth of Christ Jesus and um, then not knowing one word of really what was going on because of your state. Uh, now, after that, um, did you finish college? Were you still Catholic? Or when were you influenced from, from a Christian point of view, or am I going too fast? <laughs> no, I, I think that that's fine. I, um, after I graduated from high school, um, I began attending college, and it was about that time that I um, met what I would call uh, believers in Christ, uh, Christians. Um, and I noticed that there was something different in their life, that, and something that, that I that I that I really admired. Um, it was um, oh my at the end of the, my first year in college I became very disenchanted, and um, 
and, and, and looking back now, what I can say is I, I was searching. Um, and I, I dropped out of university and I, um, I began to travel. And um, during this, that time that I traveled, um, the Holy Spirit began working in my heart and uh, um, began showing me that, that though I was religious uh, from my upbringing, um, I still had an emptiness inside. And I couldn't put my finger on it. And I can remember um, very distinctly um, reaching kind of, the, the, I was very lonely, and I can remember praying to God or praying um, uh, while I was driving that if there's a God, would you please reveal yourself to me? And um, it wasn't um, maybe five or ten minutes after I said that prayer that I, patched, I passed a hitchhiker. And um, I didn't normally pick up hitchhikers, mm -hmm. um, but in this case, um, I chose to do so. And um, I, um, I picked up the hitchhiker, and he began to share um, Jesus' love and, and the gospel uh, to me for the first time. Um, you know, I, I think maybe I, I had heard some of these messages before, but maybe, but maybe I just wasn't inclined to, to, to hear them in, in, in the way that, that the Holy Spirit presented it to me this time. Um, I ended up uh, being taken, um, taking this hitchhiker to, to, a, to a Christian uh, home that he had lived in and not having a place to stay that night, they were kind enough to put me up and, and feed me and, and I went on my way the next day, but that had such a positive impact on me and it began to, to put a, um, a desire in my heart to really search out the truth um, because at that point, even though you know, I was raised Catholic, and I grew up in a, in a very loving home. Um, I had an emptiness that, that just wouldn't go away. And at, at that point, God began putting people in my life um, with the same message, in a message that was completely foreign and contrary to any message that I had heard before growing up Catholic. Um, I don't know if that answers yeah, your question. Yeah, that answers my question on it it really brings out a point that I think needs to be emphasized and that you felt an inner emptiness. And that, that is what so many of us as Catholics have felt. While we were very devout and in no way ever going to leave Catholicism, and we said that again and again, I remember saying to certain people when they'd ask me, uh, you know, are you Catholic? I said, Yes, uh, I am Catholic, and in a certain sense I am the Catholic Church because I'm so identified with it, because I'm a priest of the Catholic Church. And uh, those of you who are not Catholic, I would say, don't understand that this is who we are. This is not simply our religion. And uh, in Ireland it was part of our culture as well. So we had no intention of ever changing. But this inner emptiness, and I remember even as a priest, when the charismatic movement had come in and we had begun singing Christian hymns, not Catholic hymns, and we were doing it with guitars, you know, and uh, we were really trying our best to present what looked like a Christian service and I would prepare the lectures and in how we read the pieces from the Bible, even though we're reading from a lectionary and not a Bible, but that how it was read, I would get them to practice, and I would practice my own reading, and I would practice uh, my sermons where I was trying to uh, give a, a message, and trying to get examples to you know to preach, and I went to immense uh, effort to prepare uh, things like Easter and Christmas, and even Sunday masses, but particularly at Easter and Christmas, you mentioned Christmas. I remember preparing minutely the details for Christmas and uh, at Easter, the Easter candle and lighting the Easter fire and bringing the candles in, into the church, the big Easter candle and uh, putting the church into total darkness so that the light from the Paschal candle now spreads out right through the church and I would talk about, you know, we've all shared life from Christ and this is symbolized in what we have done 
from the one candle we've all lit our candles you know and it, it was beautiful typology or symbolism and then I remember when it was all over and I would go into my bedroom at night and I would feel so so empty and the next day after those big feasts when you know I'd be alone for hours in my uh, presbytery and uh, it was really really difficult you know and of course it was then that I would take a few drinks as an Irishman mm. just to just try and somehow um, placate this emptiness and it's 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 a uh, and you wouldn't even admit the emptiness to yourself, which is uh, which is sad, you know, because uh, you do not want to admit that all that you've done uh, hasn't added up. But I'm trying to say this with a with a compassion for those who do these things sincerely, because I know the sincerity and I know the intent. The intent is good. The sincerity is good. The whole drive is good, but what satisfies the drive and what comes in these symbolism and sometimes they're they're magnificent symbols that, that go on the uh, the way the liturgy is done is done with a finesse and often a grandeur that people who have not been into things Catholic don't realize and uh, then afterwards when you've done these magnificent ceremonies to sense the inner emptiness it is really uh, a taste or a feeling that unless you've gone through it you don't un you don't understand so uh, I thank you for mentioning that because it brings back memories in my own life of you know what I went through in a similar way now at that time where you were picked up by this hitchhiker and uh, you got the gospel message and he you said that this man t spoke about the love of Jesus as well and I think that is paramount that it's given in the context of God's love and God's grace and um, were you convicted at the time or was that just like the beginning of the opening of you towards Christian things? Yeah it was really the opening it, w it, w it was a seed that had been planted and and then there were there were there were seeds that 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 continue to be planted in my life probably over the next year um, I would say what 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 ultimately led to my to really understanding the gospel for the first time because during a lot of these situations I think people were, were sharing the love of Christ and sharing uh, what it really meant to be a Christian but it, it still didn't make sense to me it was still foreign to me and and I had a, a very good friend and, and he's still one of my very closest friends who grew up in a in a in a in a very evangelical uh, Christian home uh, a little different than, than than the type of home that I grew up in, from the standpoint that they they believe that that you were saved by placing your faith in Jesus Christ, and that um, it was important um, to to not only believe in Jesus Christ but but also believe that 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 you had a relationship with with God on a daily basis, and. Um, he he had been after me to attend his church for, for 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 many many months, and I always very kindly said, "Well, yeah. I really appreciate that, but um, let me think about it." And and the truth of the matter was, what was going on is I I I had developed this these friendships with with um, people that had strong faiths in uh, in Jesus Christ. Uh, on, and then on the other hand, I still had my, my, my friendships, um, my drinking friends. Yes. And uh, <coughs> I was in no condition to get up on a Sunday morning to, to attend church. Um, but finally, because I didn't want to hurt his feelings anymore, I, I said, okay, I will, come to, I will come to your church. And uh, I attended his church. And for the very first time, I heard the gospel um, in a clear and concise manner. And again, I, I may have heard the gospel before, but I think what, what had been taking place, Richard, I think that the, the Holy Spirit had begun working on my heart and began preparing my heart to hear the gospel for the first time. And it was at that time that I, that I realized that I was a sinner. And it, it didn't make any difference if I had been uh, baptized as an infant, 
whether or not I had made my communion, whether or not I had made my confirmation. None of those things made a difference, okay? What was important is, you know, who was Jesus Christ and what did he do to, 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 to change my life? And um, um, I think that I, I had unconsciously accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior at that time. Um, but like a lot of uh, people that, that have made those decisions, um, I didn't hear fireworks. I didn't hear, you know, emotional um, experiences taking place in my own life. Yeah, but, I, yeah. but I felt a desire at that point that I wanted to know more about God. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And you were being drawn then to trust in Christ alone. And, and as you correct. say, you saw that the different things you did were, didn't amount to anything from a point of view of a relationship with God. Correct. I, I uh, you know, I, I could go to church um, and go to Mass every day and, and I could, you know, help feed the poor. I, c I could do all those things, but there was still that emptiness that, that existed inside. Um, there's a verse in the Bible that says that, that if you confess your sins, He's faithful and just to forgive you your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. And up until that point, uh, I don't feel that that I had ever experienced that type of, of, of conviction or conversion. Yes, yes, yes. Well, that is the beginning of the Holy Spirit's work. Like Christ Jesus said that when the Spirit comes, He will convict of sin, righteousness, and judgment. So the first work of the Holy Spirit is to show you that you're a sinner. And where you say that you are then convinced that you're a sinner, that's the, that's the first work of the Holy Spirit. Because if we don't see that we are sinners, there's um, nothing to be saved from. We are sinners, but if we don't realize it, well then, um, in a certain sense, we're unsavable because Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Um, like Paul says that in, in the Word of God, of whom I'm the chief. He, he looked upon himself as the chief sinner. Uh, and... Um, he said, you know, I know that no good thing exists in me in my mortal flesh. You begin to realize that there's nothing in you that can merit or, you know, achieve or gain or do anything towards salvation. You've got to give up trusting entirely in yourself and to, to look to Him. Now, can you explain more precisely then how that, the time came where you really did you know, finally, fully, just really trust on Christ Jesus alone and that you maybe got an assurance? Or am I running too far? No, I, I can't. L let, me, let me back up, if I can, just real briefly and let you know that, that um, leading up to that point where I, I felt a, a desire to, to, to know Christ better, um, you know, we've, we, I've mentioned the Holy Spirit, and, and I don't want to diminish because that, that it was the Holy Spirit that was drawing me. And I, I can remember one particular instance where I, I um, was, um, I think it was a New Year's Eve, and I was on my way to a New Year's Eve party. Um, and um, uh, this particular friend that I had mentioned had invited me to, to attend a, a candlelight service at his church. And I didn't know what a candlelight service was. Um, but um, I had chosen instead to go to this party. And I can remember um, driving on the, going to the party, and and, and then just tears beginning to come down my, my face, uncontrollably, un and, and for no reason at all. And what I attribute that to was the Holy Spirit was, was bringing me under deep conviction. And I remember stopping, turning around, and going back and attending the, the candlelight service at the particular church that I was, attend you know, I was um, attending. And um, it was at that moment that I, I, I committed my life to the Lord. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it was at that moment that God began redirecting my life yeah, yeah. Um, to the point where I felt the desire to know more about Him. And I, I subsequently ended up going to a Bible college. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, yeah. and rededicating yeah. my life, rededicating yeah. my life there. Yeah, yeah. Well, when you say like dedicating or committing, you mean uh, really just trusting Him and Him alone? Is that yeah, That's correct, yeah, yes. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's, there's no other way unto, unto heaven except through Jesus Christ. Yes, yes, okay. yes. That's probably the clearer way to put it. That's it. Yeah. Yes, and, and I, at that point I realized that there was everything that I had been taught as, 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 as a youth yeah. through my young adulthood, 
that none of that mattered anymore. Yes, um, yeah. There, there was only one way um, to heaven, and that was through putting my faith and trust in Jesus Christ alone. Yes, yes, and yes. And once I realized that, and once I made that, that decision, yeah, yeah. Then, then everything made sense. Yes, and, yes. And, you know, it's, and I, I'm not sure where it says it in the, I believe it might be Romans, where it talks about where, you know, you can read the Bible or you can hear God's Word, but it never really makes sense um, if you don't have the Spirit of God, that enlightenment. Yeah, and yeah. I think up until that point, you know, I maybe heard bits and pieces of God's message, but it never really was clear and concise. But at that point that I, that I put my faith and trust in Jesus Christ alone, yeah. it was like um, everything made sense. Yeah, I, I can identify that with that a lot because in my own life, I would stand up at priest conferences and quote, for example, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, you know, which, which says clearly that you're saved by grace through faith and is not of ourselves. And in a certain sense, I was defending what you would call the biblical message clearly, but I wasn't trusting on it, on Christ alone. And it wasn't until um, Ephesians 2, 1 really bothered me, you being dead in trespasses and sins, that I saw myself as a sinner and I really cried out to God that by the Holy Spirit he would show me that I was spiritually dead and give me the gift of faith. It was then that the Holy Spirit really convicted me that I was utterly a sinner and that then I really did trust on Christ alone because it was the difference between intellectually understanding and in a certain way assenting to uh, and committing yourself to something and then the Holy Spirit convicting you and the Holy Spirit drawing you and uh, I think what you're saying what I'm trying to you know to reiterate is the fact that that's what Christ said in John chapter 3 unless a man be born again it's the Holy Spirit that enlivens us as Christ summed it up so beautifully what is born of the flesh is flesh what's born of the spirit is spirit and so when you're born again of the spirit you know that the Holy Spirit has convicted you. And um, I would just like to say to our viewer um, that what Terry and I are saying to you now is that you look to God, that he would send the Holy Spirit into your mind and heart, that you could be convicted that you are a sinner before the all-holy God. Because that essentially is the message, that you know that you're a sinner before the all-holy God. And the Holy Spirit has got to show you that. We cannot show you that. There's no church that can show you that. That's the spirit of the living God alone. But God is faithful and true. It's not that this is a bad news that you can't do it. Uh, it's good news that you can't do it because if you were to do it, you'd trust in yourself. I remember one man, I'm sorry going off a little bit here, but uh, he had come from uh, L.A., up to Portland because of um, work and uh, he um, he was really uh, really getting distraught in, in Portland and uh, um, I was going door to door and he found out that I was in one of the apartment complexes and he came in to see me you know that was quite unusual you know and he was Latino background and uh, he um, he listened to the message and uh, I told him that God is gracious and uh, he knew about being a sinner he had sold uh, uh, cocaine on the streets of LA so he knew all about being a sinner and then um, he called his brother who called me and he wanted me to meet there again in that apartment complex it wasn't where he lived and we met there one evening and he said he said Richard I have decided now finally I'm going to trust Christ and Christ alone you know as you've told me and uh, Nelson was his name. I looked in my, his eyes and said, Nelson, you can't. <laughs> I said, you're dead in trespasses. And said, uh, his face dropped. He said, you know, you've told me all of this and now you tell me I can't. I said, unless God has convicted you, you know, you can make professions, but unless 
it's really the Holy Spirit leading you, Nelson. I said, it's just going to be another ritual. I said, unless the Holy Spirit is convicting you and the Holy Spirit is, is, um, is drawing you, he said, Richard, why did you tell me all of this? And now you're telling me I can't do it. I said, I'm telling you because God is gracious. I said, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Whoever believes in him should not perish, but should have, a, have, a, have everlasting life. And he said, let me go home and think about it. It was just three days later that he called. And he f told his brother Saul, Saul Flores, uh, he said, I've been convicted and I know that I'm in Christ. And I know that, I know that the Holy Spirit has led me to trust Christ and Christ alone. And I've begun devouring the scriptures, you know. And he, he was explaining... He said, it's not just that I'm not going to sell cocaine again, but he said, I've been utterly convicted, you know. And it was, to me, it was just a testimony that Sean, and I'm sorry to go on a little bit with this, but I just think it's, it's worth saying because his wife uh, was thoroughly taken aback afterwards because she had grown up in a church where she had gone forward, made her decision, and her commitment to Christ, and was living very much like the world, but she said she was a Christian, you know, because she said she'd gone forward, made her decision, made her commitment, and she was very um, embarrassed now to have this <laughs> husband who uh, said he was convicted, totally changed, totally wanted to live the Christian life, read scripture, he wanted to read the scripture together with his wife. His wife was having none of it, you know. And uh, I thought it was, this is a real example of Nelson and his wife, of true Christianity and false Christianity, you know what I mean? And uh, I went home and I spoke to her uh, about the real message that you, the Holy Spirit's got to convict you. And it's not some decision that you make and it's not some commitment that you make. No, it's, it's, the, it's the Holy Spirit leads you and when you repent, you really change from being a sinner to wanting to live the Christian life. And she was having none of it. And the um, sad thing is that as I left Portland, Oregon, that was the same situation. Nelson was continuing strong in the things of the Lord. And I hope today it has changed and somehow that she got convicted of this false, um, confidence in her decision and you know in her going forward and all the rest of the the jargon you know because I think it's of utmost importance that when we trust in Christ Jesus and Christ alone that it is led of the Spirit so I'm, I'm really happy what you're saying there Terry and I'm in a certain sense just trying to highlight what had happened in your own life so how did things continue with you and how was your repentance translated into your life or how did you begin to live now? Well, what I ultimately did, I, 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 I ultimately went to Bible college and I, I, I felt at that point that I began to learn uh, God's Word and became much more understanding of, 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 of what it really meant to be a, a believer in Christ. And I began to 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 try to put that into into my everyday life um yes 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 and was this still in the united states or where was actually where was I, I attended bible college in canada um i i didn't know that there were bible colleges that they were as plentiful as they were and and i um actually attended bible school in in alberta canada um and continued to to go to school there um for for a couple years additional years and then God called me into um, full-time uh, profession that I that I currently uh, serve in. Yes, yes, yes. But during you know during that time, and then you know from I mean, that's been almost thirty years ago. You know, um, I've continued to 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 read God's word and, and try to understand God's word um, and, and try to obey God's word. And and I can say that I've. You know, I've, I've made mistakes, you know, yes, I continue yes. to make mistakes. Um, but I know that I have an advocate with the Lord Jesus Christ and that I am forgiven. 
yes, that I yes. can go and I can pray and I can ask for forgiveness and I can move on and I can, I can, I can grow. grow yeah, in faith. I think the verse that you quoted earlier on is so important. First John one nine, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You know, He, He it is who is faithful. How is He just to forgive us because we are totally sinners? He is just because of the perfect sacrifice of Christ Jesus and the perfect life of Christ Jesus. It's the only way that God could be just to forgive us sinners. It's, it's really wonderful because, like in the words of Romans 3.26, that he might be just and the justifier. I remember struggling with that verse. How could God be in any way holy or just in saving me since I was so lost, not just in my sins, but in my thinking that my rituals saved me or made me right. And you know, how could he be just? He was just because Christ Jesus substituted for me. You know, when I first of all saw substitution, that there was a, a perfect substitute for me. And like you, I've made mistakes, but I know that my relationship with the Father is not just based on my faithfulness and never will be. It's based on Christ Jesus' faithfulness That's right. and, and based on what he did so that um, while I can again go back and confess my sins again to God and ask him to forgive me, uh, I don't l ever lose the relationship. Uh, one of the Bible verses that is precious to me is Paul's word in Colossians, but you are complete in him who is the head of all principality and power. We are complete or perfect in Christ, who is the head of all principality and power. That's how complete we are. In ourselves, we're, we're never complete. We will always be, be being sanctified. But because of our completeness and because we're accepted in him, as it says in Ephesians 1, 6, accepted in the beloved, because we're accepted as perfect legally in God's sight, in Christ, then we want to live lives that show forth the holiness of God and the perfection of Christ Jesus. And this is the greatest motivation and joy. Now, I'm sure part of your joy has been, Terry, wanting to share with your parents and sharing with your brothers and sisters. You haven't told us about them. Could you share something then of how you've tried to get the message home to your own family? Sure. Um, when, I, when I first put my, 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 my trust in, in, in Christ as a, as a, as a young man, um, it was very difficult for my, for my parents uh, to accept that. Um, I think that, and understandably, I mean, I think that they maybe thought that I had joined some cult, yeah. uh, that, that maybe um, I had been brainwashed. Um, and um, it wasn't until they began to see, see, see the fact that I, I hadn't gone in some, you know, crazy direction that, that they, um, they began to trust me. Uh, and, and over the years, I found that I've, you know, I've had the opportunity to share, share, uh, Christ's message with both my mother and father. My, my father passed away um, about six months ago, um, and over the last 30 years, I, I, uh, um, you know, I've shared the gospel with him many times. Um, though he continued to practice the Catholic faith, um, you know, I'm trusting that, that, that he did put his faith and trust in Jesus Christ uh, for, for the forgiveness of his sins. Yeah, it um, is. That sometimes it's quite painful when we think of our own parents, you know. Uh, my own father, uh, I was still very much a priest when I was called back from Trinidad West Indies uh, to come back to Dublin. Uh, and when I reached his bedside, he was already unconscious. And uh, I put on my priest stole, you know, over my black suit, you know, and collar. And... Uh, I took up the book to do anointing of the sick, you know, that I had done many, many times. And I just, I just couldn't, I could, I couldn't do it. This is my own father and he's unconscious. And then he comes to consciousness and he starts to say some words on his lips and he's obviously now 
hearing and he, he's conscious and he's looking up and he's recognizing me and I put down the book and took off the stole and just tried to be myself and got down close to him when he was in the bed and I said, Daddy, it's only Christ. I said, him alone. I said, Daddy, please say after me, Jesus, to you I live, Jesus, to you I die. Jesus, in life and in death, I'm yours. And then his lips began to move, and like he was saying this. Now, I was still very much a priest at the time, and it was going to be very many years before I actually did what I was trying to say at that moment. You know what I mean? I, I don't know how it was that the Holy Spirit moved me because I was still very much a priest, but this is my own father, and I was telling him to trust Christ. And it had a profound effect on me afterwards when I um, prayed over sick people, even though I still did the anointing of the sick and all the Catholic rituals, but it was, I was different. And that is the sister who has come to faith in Christ. She's the one who was opposite the other side of the bed. And uh, I just hope and pray and trust God that somehow that my father, while he was Catholic, had heard something of the gospel, despite who I was, you know, and I know how hard it is because uh, we dearly love our parents. As We dearly love um, you, the Catholic listener, uh, because we say these things in love, that you would understand the difference between religion and who Christ Jesus is in the message. We are speaking so that we highlight the love of Christ Jesus and the love of God. Again, in my own life, I talked about my father being a military man, and he was often away from the home as a military man when I grew up. And then later on in his life, he got tuberculosis and was in Wales in a sanatorium. So he wasn't even in Ireland, he was in Wales. And I had six sisters and my mother, my brother was way, way younger than I was. He, he came way down the line. He was second to last of eight children. And I was very conscious of having no father figure in the home. And I always wanted, uh, in a certain sense, to have had a father who really cared for me. And that when I would read the scripture about uh, Abba Father, you know, when I was a priest, I was longing for a relationship with my father in heaven, you know, and this was a big part of my own search to want to know the intimacy of the love of the father. And it was many of those texts, like the spirit cries to our spirit that we are children of God, that I was reading as a priest, that I want to know the intimacy of the love of God. For God so loved the world. I want to know a salvation that is based on the love of the loving Ab Abba Father as shown forth that he sent forth his son to live a perfect life so that in trusting him I could come to eternal life. I want to know a gospel message that is based on God's love and that will bring me into a relationship where I can rest in the love of my Abba Father. And that's what I thank God that I've come to. And I pray that would come out of the, you know, the, the, uh, the speaking that we do to, you know, the Catholic person and to others who listen, that they understand that we are highlighting the love of God and the relationship. And I think that has come out with your testimony, Terry. So can you say uh, a little bit, we have about three minutes or maybe a little bit more left, can you give a little summary of what you would like to say to the, a Catholic person looking, or maybe one of your relatives, because you sure. still have relatives who are Catholic. Oh, very much so, yes. And let me just say too that, you know, I, I, I mentioned my father, you know, I continued to, to be a witness to my mother and to share with my mother. My, my brothers, on the other hand, have all come to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, and they all, um, uh, are serving him um, in 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 different capacities. Um, Can you explain just how you would give the gospel today? You know, to to somebody who is beginning to inquire. 
Well, I, I think what I would do is I would first ask them um, if they recognize themselves as being a sinner. Um, that's first and foremost. Um, the Bible says that for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, and that the punishment or the or or the the consequences of that is is that the wages of that sin is death or eternal eternal separation from God. But it also says that that God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that everybody that believes in Him um, won't perish but will have everlasting life. And to my Catholic friends, I, I would just ask you that um, it's not through the priest that we gain eternal life, but it's only through a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. It's only through our, our willingness to put our faith and trust in Christ alone through the help of the Holy Spirit will we gain eternal, eternal life in heaven. Christ came that we would have abundant life and that we would, we would have that abundance of a relationship with God and that sacraments and rituals don't do anything but trusting in Christ delivers and it really brings people to a joy unspeakable and full of glory. That's, that's right. And uh, that, is, that, that is the essence of what you've been saying all along and I, I thank God for the clarity of what you've said and that you've emphasized the conviction of the Holy Spirit and there was the Holy Spirit that led you to do what you did in, tr in placing your trust in Christ alone and that's the message that you're sharing and uh, I think that has been been really really wonderful you know so one final word for the listener then from you sure well I would just encourage any of you who who have not put your your your, your faith in Jesus Christ and maybe are, are continuing to cling to, to your past, be it your confirmation, be it your communion, maybe being the fact that you were baptized as an infant, maybe even the fact that you continue to wear your scapular um, uh, and, and wear your different holy medals. All of those things mean nothing um, in the eyes of God. God says that I came that you might have life and have life more abundantly. Um, he also said that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God did not say, as long as you're wearing my scapular, as long as you're wearing my medals, as long as you've, 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 you've had extreme unction while you're on your deathbed, regardless of the fact that somebody might light candles for you okay after you pass away none of those things mean anything the only thing that assures that you will have eternal life in heaven is by putting your personal faith and trust in in the Lord Jesus Christ yes um, that is a startling thing and in a certain sense what you said uh, Terry there none of these things can deliver uh, sometimes it can come even as like an electric shock. I remember as a priest uh, doing very devoutly extra unction, your sacrament for the sick, and uh, hearing people's confession, uh, and giving them communion, and then anointing of the sick, like giving them the whole final rites of the church, and then, then seeing some of those people die cursing God. Now, it was only one or two incidences where that happened. It wasn't general, but it was enough to shock me that here I have done everything and it hasn't worked. Do you know what I mean? The person is dying and they're utterly uh, separate from God. I can see it in what the way that they're dying and I would wait on when many people were dying and in a certain sense I was shocked and uh, I just pray that you, uh, viewer, uh, will not need to be shocked <laughs> that just the precious testimony that has been shared this morning and the scriptures, that it is simply, as Terry said, if you confess to God, he is faithful and just to forgive all our sins. He is faithful, he is true, and that's the message that Terry has been sharing this morning, or wherever, what time of day it is with you, 
this is the message to trust on the finished work of Christ and to know that everlasting life or abundant life that Terry spoke about. I thank you so much, Terry, for Thanks, this time together. And thank you for listening. It would be lovely to hear from you. It's always an encouragement for those who make these programs to hear from you. Please write. And even if you have some questions, please write. You will find our webpage address at the foot of your screen. So thank you for viewing. And pray that the Holy Spirit will convict you and you'd know that everlasting life of which we speak. Thank you. And the Lord's abundant grace be with you. Amen.